Greetings and welcome to my new calculus channel. My name is John Gabriel and today I'm going to be showing you very simply why pi is a constant. So if you look at mainstream sites, um, they're all morons by the way, and uh, look what this uh, question is about. It says proof that pi is constant without using limits. Well, of course you don't have to use limits at all and the ancient Greeks didn't use limits. So uh, a lot of confusion here in the answers. Here this guy says it sounds hard, it's being transcendental, uh, it being transcendental, seems to pre preclude the existence of a proof that won't appeal to the concept of limits. <laughs> okay, yeah, you aren't a mathematician, that's for sure. And this guy here says the problem is with defining the length of a circle without appealing. So a lot of garbage. Um, all of them a bunch of morons. And then this guy pops up here who's got a, a rank of 27, and he goes into a long rant and a dissertation about why it's constant. It's also garbage. And he comes up with things like, uh, however, any real number base area, including elementary calculus, Jordan measure, Lebesgue measure, is set up with a minimum requirement of compatibility with the geometric operations of dissection and rigid motion. You know, this kind of thing could almost be written by an AI. <laughs> I don't know the imbecile who wrote this, but it's somebody called Open in You. Let's just see here out of curiosity. Yeah, this this idiot. And he's got two gold badges and four silver badges. Okay. Right. Never mind that. Anyway. And of course, there are lots of other answers. Um there's one here with you. This is this is probably closer, but it only got seven. Uh, it's showing what Euclid did in Proposition Twelve. Um, I think it was Proposition. No, in Book Twelve, it was a proof that Euclid did in Book Twelve that the areas uh, of two circles, the areas of two circles, are proportional to their diameters. Okay. Now, all these things are easy, nice and good, but now I'm going to show you something now that's going to blow your mind. It's so simple. You ready? Okay. Grab a cup of coffee because you might need to think. All right, let's get this crap out of the way and all the other mainstream crap. Now, what is proportion, first of all? I'm just going to give you some background details. So proportion says that if you have a radius, which is half of this diameter, right? As you can see, there, that's two, that's four, that's three, that's six, okay? Then the circle increases and decreases accordingly, okay? It can't be zero, of course, because then that's no longer a circle. Right, so now that's proportion in a nutshell, but I'm going to come back to it in a while. The next thing is we have the symptom of pi. Now, how do we get pi? What I've done here, by the way, is I've taken the length of this circle, which is a diameter, and I've taken its circumference, and I've placed them at right angles like that, and then I've used this radius as the unit, which means that C divided by D will give me pi, right? doesn't matter what it is. It can be any, any diameter you like, and any radius, any radius in any diameter, this value here will always be pi because it will be divided by the unit. So in this case, the unit is 2, so you still end up getting pi, right? Stop and think about that for a while because I know you're most of you are idiots. So uh, try that out, and I'll give you a link to this applet so you can play around with it, okay? Now, let's just get that out of the way there for a second. I'm going to show you something called algebraic measure. Now, so if we have two line segments, we'll say that the red segment is the antecedent and the blue segment is the consequent, yeah? So that means that if we had a pen and this was the red segment, this would be the blue segment, right? So I haven't actually put a color there, but you could color them. If that was red, this here was red and this was blue, then you'd have the ratio that is being represented by this red line and this blue line. So I don't want that there anymore, so I'm going to get it out of the way. So now, 
what is what is algebraic measure algebraic measure is when one takes the consequent and tries to measure the antecedent okay so suppose that that is two and that is four right two and four that means if i use this as a unit it's one two right does that make sense now i can take any other uh proportional triangle okay see i can take any other length i could take that length i could take this length I could take any of these lengths and any of these equivalent ratios will have the same measure okay that means four over two or just two if you divide four by two okay so and that's why this is constant now what is stopping me from doing the same thing by taking a circle circumference and a diameter I could put the circumference on this side here and the diameter on this side here. So let me do that. There you go. Here's pi. Whoops, moved it too far. Here's pi and here's the diameter. And any of these will give me the measure of pi, which means that pi is a constant. It doesn't matter what circle you've got. Okay. You, it doesn't matter what circle you have. Let's that circle, this circle, do you see what's happening? Okay, so very easy proof that the ancient Greeks knew, by the way, the ancient Greeks knew pi was constant. What about proving that it can't be written as a fraction? Well, Archimedes also knew that, and he had two propositions, one in on spheres and the other one in spirals, where he shows that pi lies between two extremes okay similar to the squeeze here and most of that will be too difficult for even the brightest mainstream math professors who i consider to be absolute morons so if you want a simpler proof you could easily take <clears throat> one of the mainstream proofs which if you understand mainstream calculus will be easier for you what you do there is you just take uh, a series for pi and show that it converges okay that will show you <clears throat> that pi is constant. And there's also proof that it is, uh, that it can't be written as a fraction. In other words, it can't really be written as C over D. So do you realize that every time some mainstream idiot, your, your professor or your professor of calculus or your teacher of calculus has written, has written this C over D, They've made a mistake, okay? You can't write C over D. Because why? Because if you write C over D, this means that you've completed this measure of this ratio. Circumference to diameter, okay? In other words, you measured it off. One, two, three, and this little itsy bitsy here, <clears throat> which you couldn't measure, right? So now in geometry, people, in geometry, let's get out of there. In geometry, you can measure any ratio. It doesn't matter what the ratio is. Okay. So <clears throat> what that means is if you have the antecedent on this side with the, with, the, with the C's and the consequent on this side, this line here as a ratio to the unit is always the result of that division or measure. Division or measure. Did you notice I said division or measure? There's something that you need to purchase, by the way. Let me tell you what it's called. It's called the importance of learning the right way. And it's all about measure and division. So if you go over here, uh, this book is now almost complete, but it's been updated. And it tells you how you can learn things the right way and understand things the right way. Now, if you had learned the right way, you wouldn't be a moron like your math teacher or your calculus teacher. You'd know these things. <clears throat> and you wouldn't have to ask uh, on any of those crap mainstream moderated sites. You'd know the answers to these things. So when we say C measured by D, right? As I've said here, C measured by D, it means we completed the measure. Now in geometry, we can do that. Why can we do that in geometry? Okay, let's draw a little circle there. Because, right, because in geometry, these are similar triangles and the sides are in proportion okay and if this is uh, c and this is d 
And this side here is going to be C over D with respect to this line as a unit. Okay. I was the genius who discovered these things, by the way. Nobody else knew before I came along. And so you've learned something new now. And that is why pi is constant without any bullshit of limits or anything. And of course, if you want to prove that it can't be written as a fraction, well, you can try the works of Archimedes, or you can take a much simpler mainstream proof using limits. The choice is yours. If you're not a rare subscriber to my channel, become one. Okay, there is an old proof here that I have, by the way, and it's incomplete on purpose. This proof is incomplete. You have to fill in the missing parts. Okay. Yes, I did it on purpose because why should I give proofs like this to the world when I'm not recognized as the greatest and rewarded financially? So anyway, you could check this video out and see if you could fill the the uh, missing parts in. I bet that you can't. And in fact, I would place a million dollar bet. That's how certain I am that you can't. But anyway, so uh <clears throat> you can download this applet i'll put a link to it and play with it and be sure to watch this video several times because it takes a while to absorb everything i've shown you here i'll also place some links to what all these things mean to what gabriel arithmetic means so for example if you say d times pi you're gonna get c okay D times pi, you're going to get C. So the product of these two line segments will give you this one. And of course, C divided by pi is D, and C divided by D is pi. And that's all great. So you can join my members only channel for $4.99. And if you do, you'll get access to my uh, books free. In other words, you won't have to pay $9.99. But to be honest, if I were you, you need to get a copy of this book because it's probably the most important mathematics book ever written on arithmetic and number and to understand what these things are. Now, if you take a look inside here, it might seem like it's very simple, but trust me, it gets a lot more complicated than what you see in the, in the sample. Okay. So if you look at the sample, it looks like it's written for a, a, a two-year-old, but don't be fooled by that it gets very, very complex in a nice way, in a simple way. That's pretty much it. I'm John Gabriel. This is a new calculus channel. Till next time.